Welcome back to another Sunday video here, and this week we have a Q&A, and the first question comes from Mariah, and she basically asks, is a three to four year degree worth it for in fitness, or our PT courses, and that sort of thing, is that sort of thing worth it? And I'm guessing this is probably a question that a lot of my followers have is, hey, I, I want to kind of work in the field, what do you recommend for courses and that sort of thing to be able to do something like this. And, you know, the first thing I think it's important to consider is what's your goal? Do you want to be an online coach? Do you want to be a professor and work in academics? Do you want to just be a personal trainer in person? What is your actual goal? All right. So first I would ask that. Now, I absolutely don't think that a degree or to be an online coach, I don't think that a degree or necessarily a certain PT course is absolutely necessary. However, I do think that you have to be educated. So whether you do that through podcasts or through reading stuff and that sort of thing, you have to be educated and you have to know what you're talking about. And I think that having a general background of basic physiology, maybe even some biology, some biomechanics, stuff like that is probably a good idea. And that's what a three to four year degree is going to do for you. And that's what a PT course is going to do for you. And I think that there's a lot of good options out there for kind of online courses that are specific to bodybuilding and stuff like that. So you've got the JPS Health and Fitness Mentorship Program. I think that would be a great starting place. You've got the, I th <laughs> they just switched their name. I think it's called the PT Collective. It used to be called, I think it was Shredded by Science, but I think it's called the PT Collective now. They have their own course for coaches and stuff like that. I think those would be great starting places to lay that foundation of knowledge. And I think that they also have some specific things on getting clients, client retention and stuff like that. Now, if you want to be a personal trainer in person, I think that you might have to get a ACSM like certificate or something like that just for the sole purpose of that's what they require in that position. Because some like PT gyms require you to be ACSM certified or have one of those certificates. So I kind of view those more as a, a means to an end. I mean, I don't think that their information is terrible in them, but for specific like bodybuilding and physique, physique purposes, I think that an SBS course or the PT collective course, JPS health and fitness, or even a three to four year degree in just general exercise science is a decent approach. Now, if you want to be an online coach and that sort of thing, I think that one of the best things that you can do is look for people that are in the position that you want to be in three or four years. Look for those people that are where you want to be and a little bit ahead of you. And C, do research, look at what they're doing, and see if there's anywhere where you can add value to them. See if whether it is editing blog posts or whether it is taking care of some of their social media stuff or whatever it might be. Try to start building that relationship with those people so that someday you're kind of on the radar to, hey, if they're ever looking to hire on more people as coaches under their kind of brand or if they're ever looking for more help, they might make a good recommendation to someone else and building those relationships is going to be invaluable. That's exactly what I did. I started listening to podcasts. I was like, Hey, I think that this online coaching thing is pretty cool. So I started reaching out to people that are in the position that I wanted to be. And it just so happened that I was able to help Steve out with some stuff in his Facebook group. And you have to be really patient with this. And I, I helped Steve and the revive stronger crew for about two and a half years for free. Now, it wasn't like I was working 30 hours a week for him or anything like that. It was probably, I don't know, five hours a week or something like that, but it was for two and a half years. 
before I actually was hired on as a coach. And that wasn't even kind of my my initial thing. I didn't view it as a way to, okay, I'm going to kind of work my way in here, which is fine if you do do that. But my thing was like, hey, I want to learn from this guy who's in the position that I am. And then, hey, I can either go out on my own or maybe I will work for them someday. So that's kind of my, my recommendations on that. Now, I'm not a life coach or anything like that. I'm just a 22-year-old guy trying to figure his own shit out. So take that for what it's worth, all right? The next question comes from Sphephoromic. I'm so sorry. Sphearomorphic, maybe. And they ask, thoughts on longer mesocycles, so like three month plus. I think that it's probably fine, like as long as you're within your minimum effective volume and maximum recoverable volume and you're progressing and that sort of thing, I don't see a problem with it. And some people take a more reactive approach to deloads to where they don't deload until they start seeing symptoms of kind of needing a deload. And I think that's fine. I think that approach works. Now, I do think that scaling your volume with your recovery capabilities makes a lot of sense to me. And each week you can probably recover from a little bit more. So it probably makes sense to push that volume a little bit more. And I don't see you being able to scale your volume with your recovery capabilities each and every week and still have that mesocycle last three months. So I generally see my mesocycles being anywhere from like four to seven, maybe eight weeks because I do jump volume a little bit more. But if you're someone that's like, hey, I'm cool with just kind of hanging out somewhere between my MEV and my MRV and I'm going to do more reactive deloads to when I need it. I could see those mesocycles being a little bit longer. All right. So there's no one clear answer to any of this stuff. And depending on the, the context there, it's going to depend on what you decide to do. All right. Next question. What's a primer? So a primer phase is essentially a lower volume phase to where you bring your training volume down and you bring your calories up to maintenance. And basically the purpose of this phase is to reduce previous accumulated training fatigue, reduce fatigue on joints, tendons, ligaments, make you a little bit more sensitive to training volume again, similar to how like a deload will, you know how you get sore a little bit easier after a deload and you're a little bit more sensitive to that volume? Well, after several mesocycles of hypertrophy training, you might need a full phase, so a uh, three to six month phase at maintenance of reduced volumes, kind of like an extended deload, to make you more sensitive for several more mesocycles, all right? And it can have some psychological benefits and stuff like that. And if, if you wanna learn more and everything there is to know about a primer phase, the Revive Stronger team, Steve and Pascal, have created a book on the primer phase, which is really helpful. I've read it a few times, it's, it's really good. But I hope that kind of gets at what you're asking. That's kind of what it is and the purpose for it, all right? And he has another question here and Basically, I think the question was, how do you know if the weight you're losing is from fat compared to muscle? And I think that the number one thing is how you're looking. So does it literally look like you're losing fat? Do your photos look like you're dropping fat? I think that's the number one thing because even if you look at like circumference measurements of your muscles, those are going to go down when you're in a fat loss phase because you're going to have less muscle pump probably because you're eating less carbohydrates, less food in total. And you're losing fat tissue around your arms and your circumference measurements and that sort of thing. So I don't think circumference measurements are great for, am I losing fat compared to muscle? And I think that the biggest thing is, do you look like you're losing fat alongside what's your performance looking like? Are you, are you at least not dropping performance at a very fast rate? Are you maintaining your performance pretty well? And I know that's subjective. Some people respond differently, but usually you can maintain your performance for quite some time while going through a fat loss phase. And if you're maintaining your performance pretty good and it looks in photos or even in the mirror, because fat loss happens pretty uh, relatively quick, you can generally see changes in the mirror. If you're seeing that performance and just what you see, that's a pretty good idea that, hey, I'm probably losing a little bit more fat here compared to muscle. Additionally, you can compare how you're looking at 
X body weight compared to previously. So if you cut down to 170 pounds and you look worse than cutting down to 170 pounds previously, then there's a chance that this cutting phase just you didn't respond as well to it or you didn't have as good of a gaining phase or something like that. All right. But the two biggest things I would look at is photos and gym performance. All right. And the next question here comes from Evo and he asks, what are some of the most successful kind of traits that I see from clients? And this one's a little bit challenging for me to answer because I mean, I don't say this to be like sound arrogant or anything like that, but my clients are awesome and most of them are successful. All right. So they, they all do a hell of a job. And I think that that's, that's one of the best things about being a, a coach for revive stronger and someone that has a, like people come to us for coaching and usually we're, we can be a little bit more selective on who we take on as clients and stuff like that. But shameless plug here, we just brought on Harry Smith as a coach and I think that he has some availability. So I'll have the link down below. But in regards to what I was saying there is people that come to us have probably listened to the podcast are probably pretty smart and they've probably already been fairly successful. So it makes my job a lot easier to win because they're already educated. They already have a background of being pretty successful. But I guess if I had to narrow it down to what makes them more successful is the biggest thing is probably what their life looks like. So their lifestyle. Are they, is their life conducive to training and nutrition and less stress and that sort of thing. And how are they at managing that? How do they perceive that stress in their life? And people that perceive stressful times as challenges, like my man, Javier, he is so good about like recently he had to move from where he was living to another place. And he had multiple interviews that were like hours from where he lived. So he was traveling back and forth and he was in the gym at like 4am and he was like, yeah, you know, it's kind of stressful, but it's a good stress. It means that I'm pushing myself and it means that I have challenges in my life. And if I didn't have these stressful times and these challenges, then life would be kind of boring. And I was just like, man, this guy is my guy. And I think that that's, and he's had such, so much success. Like he has gained, I've been working with Javier for like 15, 16 months, like a year and a half. And he's gained like 20 pounds. And his waist circumference has increased by like three centimeters, like tidy. So, and he's just looking jacked. He's performing well and doing a good job. So that's one of the biggest things is they perceive their stress in their life as something that's a challenge and something that's opportunistic. All right. And I would say another successful trait is clients that are good at kind of staying out of their own way. And what I mean by this is clients that are good at when they come to me and they tell me their goal of, Hey, I want to go through a gaining phase. They're good at sticking to that goal. And I'm like, Hey, I think it would be best for us to go through four to six months of gaining here. The clients that seem to be successful are the ones that embrace that. Not to say that they, I push them to get fat or anything like that fat, but the ones that are okay with that and they are okay with that weight gain and they stick to that plan rather than, you know, I, I have seen not necessarily with a lot of my own clients, but just in general with people that ask me questions online and stuff. And by the way, YouTube comments, like they are terrible. So I can only see, like, I only get notified on your first comment. I don't get notified on the comments you reply to my comments. So if it looks like I'm not answering stuff, it's just because I don't get notified by YouTube. And honestly, the best way to contact me is Ryan at revivestronger.com. Shoot me an email. All right. But where was I going? Um, yes. So the ones that are able to stick to the game plan and don't, you know, like I said, sometimes online, I one month someone asks, asked me if it's a good idea to gain weight. I was like, yeah, it might be. And then three weeks later, it's like, ah, I have to go on a cutting phase. And the ones that really have that long-term view, they understand very clear on what their goals are. I map out the plan 
and they stick to the plan. Those are a couple of the biggest things. So those are just the things that come to my head. But like I said before, my, my clients are awesome. I'm very lucky to have the clients I do. So the next question comes from Dev. And he asks, how do I find my maintenance volume for a primer phase? So you've been going through multiple gaining phases. You think it's a good idea to go through a lower volume phase to kind of resensitize yourself, kind of like what I talked about earlier. How do you know your maintenance volume? Well, I think a good general rule of thumb is to go for about 70 to 80% of your MEV. So your 70 to 80% of your week one volumes should probably be plenty to maintain on. Like if people are isocaloric, meaning they're not in a calorie deficit or calorie surplus, and they're eating enough protein, it seems as though for like two or three weeks, you can maintain muscle without training. So for a three to five week primer phase, you can probably maintain your muscle with, I would say even half of your MEV, but I think that it's probably a good idea to play it safe and to go for about 70 to 80% of your minimally effective volume. So if you usually start around 10 sets, okay, maybe throughout this primer phase, we do about seven sets. I think that's very reasonable, all right? So that's how I would approach that, Dev. And the final question comes from Greg, a client, Greg Stone. I really like your name, Greg. Greg's my man. Kind of just started recently coaching him, but we already got a good vibe going, so it's good. I got good vibes with all my clients. Donna, you're awesome too. I know you watch these. Some of my other clients might watch these, but they don't tell me as much, so. All right, anyways, um, Greg asks, looking fat on a deload, is that something that you notice a lot? And absolutely. A lot of my clients and myself personally notice that while going through a deload, so a single week of lower volumes and stuff like that, generally notice that they feel a little bit more fluffy and maybe a little bit more fat. And I think that this is totally common and usually people feel much better when they get back in to, the, to their next training cycle. Now, why might people feel this way? Well, probably just less cellular swelling in the muscles so your muscles aren't as pumped. So you're not pushing the muscles out against the skin as much. So that subcutaneous fat just shows a little bit more, would be my guess. And then when you start the training cycle back up, you kind of get that pump again and you feel much, much better about things. And while in the deload, you're probably maybe a little bit less active as well. So you just have some things that line up to feel a little bit more fluffy. Maybe you have a little bit more time to be thinking about your physique. So there could be a whole bunch of different things going on, but my biggest thing would be, yeah, that decrease in cellular swelling usually makes people feel a little bit more fluffy. So just be aware of that. Trust that, hey, when you start gaining or start in your muscle cycle again, you'll feel better. And try not to just pull the trigger on a fat loss phase because you feel a little bit fluffy in your deload, all right? So that's all I got for you this week. I appreciate you watching and I'll see you next Sunday.